Okay, so I'm going to start. Um, uh, I'm Ned Block. I'm introducing Giulio Tononi. Uh, let me start just by saying that there are four major theories of consciousness, um, of which the integrated information theory, of, of which Giulio is the originator, is one. The others are the global workspace theory, the high order thought approach, and the local uh, recurrence uh, uh, theory. Um, I should say, one thing about the the uh, 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 Julio's theory, the integrated information theory, is it's the only one of these theories that's mathematically precise, um, and it is the topic of um, an adversarial collaboration funded by Templeton World Charities, uh, pitting the integrated information theory against the global neuronal workspace theory. So I have a special affection for the um, integrated information theory because it pinpoints areas in the back of the head as important to consciousness. And uh, the local recurrence theory, which I, I favor, overlaps with it in that respect. And there are other similarities, too, because the integrated information theory emphasizes uh, recurrence and uh, that you can't get consciousness with a purely feed-forward network. Um, so. We're happy to have um, uh, Giulio Tononi speaking to us today. Um, he's um, uh, a uh, both a neuroscientist and a psychiatrist. Uh, he has two holds two chairs at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and in addition to his uh, work on consciousness, he's also an expert on sleep and director of the uh, Consciousness and Sleep Lab at the University of Mad University of Wisconsin at Madison. Um, so the the, the setup here will be that um, Julio will talk first about consciousness, uh, then we'll pause for questions, um, and then uh, we'll go on to free will, uh, and there'll be questions after that. Okay, Julio, take it away. Very well, let me get the screen first. Okay, you see it? Yes, yes, fine. Okay, and I, what, what I will do is stop my video so we can focus on the content. First, thanking you, Ned, and Liat, and also Uri and the entire group is truly, you know, I'm very grateful for the opportunity of talking to this group of both philosophers and neuroscientists, because this is really what, you know, the work on consciousness requires. It requires uh, considering all approaches in a very equanimous manner, and I mean it. And I suppose that I'm here partly because uh, it should be clear that consciousness is critical for free will. If you want to truly understand free will, you need also to have some notion of what consciousness is. And I do believe that. I believe we must indeed start from consciousness itself. You know, it's consciousness is not just the world not, as was said a long time ago, uh, it is really key to understand consciousness for understanding many issues in both ontology and metaphysics, going from meaning to knowing and certainly to free will. So in the first part, as you heard, I will briefly summarize IAT to the extent that can be done. And uh, it's sort of important because IAT is unusual. It takes things about consciousness from a perspective that's different from the usual one. It starts from experience itself as what truly exists immediately and indubitably and takes it from there rather than starting say from behaviors functions or the brain itself and i do believe that it is essential to have a clear notion of one's ontology when one deals with free will so that's the first part and the second part moves from the ontology to causation you also need for free will i believe a clear account of what we mean by causation and specifically what causes what which we call actual causation so that will be the second part that leads to free will and what IT implies for it. The downside of this rather long you know, program is that I will have to present IT and its implications for free will rather quickly without much time to explain anything in detail for which I will refer you to at least some key papers. And I sort of ask for in, your indulgence about all of this. So let me then move to the <coughs> fundamental message, if you wish, which is this, that to the extent that IIT is correct as a theory of consciousness, there is true free will, free will in a fundamental sense. 
And I will hope it will become clear later on what I mean by true free will. But that's the overall message. So I will just set a very brief stage about free will by saying that when I think about free will, and I know you have thought about it much longer and in much more diverse manner than myself, I think of it in the following way. I think of it as consciousness, the fundamental requirements. There is no free will without consciousness. That's certainly how I see it. But there are some other key ingredients, which are alternatives. I must be able to envision multiple courses of action, which I call the freedom of imagination. I'll get to that later on. I must have reasons. I must be able to choose based on such reasons, which I call a freedom of evaluation. I must be able to decide and intend an action the will proper, if you wish. And then I must be able to control, including causing and executing the action of freedom of execution. Now, these things have been debated for many, many decades, if not to mention centuries, and certainly by the group here. And so I don't want to get into any you know, discussion really about the various options that there could be here. I just want to sort of stake the position I take, which is more about the paradigmatic sort of deliberative kind of free will, which I will then from now on essentially outline in sketch form like this. I am there conscious. I'm thinking about my courses of action. I could do this or that. I go through my reasons in this idealized scenario and use my reasons to come to a decision, which I then either execute immediately or I keep the intention in my mind and I will do it later on. So that's the basic scenario we'll go back to. There are many other aspects a concept of the self, the values that underlie the reasons, the beliefs, and then of course, what are intentions and the issues of origination, autonomy and self-forming actions. All of that is obviously key. I won't be able to go into all of that. I'm just aware of it. I want to mention though, the bare bones of this free will scenario. So with that, let me just go to a short introduction to integrated information theory. The key idea here, as I say, different from what normally is done, is that IAT does not start from behavioral functional neural correlates. You don't take the brain and ask, how, how does it give rise to consciousness? How do we solve this mystery? It starts from consciousness itself. That's what needs to be explained. And it does so by identifying those properties of consciousness, which are essential. By that, I mean that they are immediate, indubitable, and true of every conceivable experience. IIT calls them axioms. And there is in fact, nothing that's more axiomatic than that in my mind. It then translates these essential phenomenal properties into essential physical properties, which it calls cause effect power. Those are the properties that a physical system must satisfy to account for the presence of experience. And those are called postulates in IIT. And finally, the goal is to account for all phenomenal properties in terms of physical properties, not just the essential properties, but also the one that make every experience the particular way it is. So the specific properties that make the experience of spatial extendedness the way it is, that makes time flow, that make objects feel as if they bind general with particular features, colors, sounds, and so on. So that is the overall goal. I'll throw in, because of the preponderance of philosophers here, some very simple mind assumptions, which are not that surprising really that IIT makes. And starting from experience itself, the idea is to proceed with, a, you know, inference from a good explanation. I prefer not to say best inference from a good explanation that is based essentially in the notion of realism, that things do exist independent of my own experience. Solipsism is out as a good explanation. Above all, physicalism in an operational sense. The criterion for existence is cause effect power, taking and making a difference. And that can be embodied essentially operationally in a transition probability matrix. You take something, you check whether it takes or make a difference. That's the essence of what physical means. And ideally we go down to the smallest units that we can actually observe and manipulate operationally, the unit transition probability matrix which is simply because if you go down to the smallest units, then in principle, you don't leave anything out. IAT, importantly, actually don't assume any intrinsic residue. It's ideally fully operational. Everything is cause effect power all the way down. And so I'll just remind you then, the key step 
of not starting from physics and trying to sort of squeeze consciousness out of it, not phenomenology out of physics, which is the usual starting point, at least since Galileo, but starting from phenomenology itself, which is the source of all explanation and the target in the end of all explanation. And from this, see what, how far we can go with an operational, that is physical approach. And here's a key slide that basically says, okay, you start on the left, basically with Descartes, you take experience, what it is like to be as primary, that is what exists immediately and indubitably. And then from there, you posit that there is a world outside of you, independent of you, which is physical, takes and makes a difference and atomic. Here is indicated as a physical substance, say the brain, within the brain, some smaller units, say neurons, or you could take anything you want. Here we have just four units. And we can observe them, you know, by calcium imaging, electrodes, you name it, and manipulate it, say optogenetically. Out of this, we can basically describe, ideally, a transition probability matrix for the units. We can see the cause effect power of the substrate at whatever level we want. And then we want to explain the properties of experience. As I said, the first important step to go beyond the card is to say not just that experience exists immediately and indubitably, but to ask, are there some properties which are also immediate and indubitable, but are also true of every conceivable experience? And it identifies five such properties and none other than those. And I'd be very, very short. Intrinsicality means that the experience is subjective. It is for the experiencer, not for somebody else, so to speak. Composition means that the experience is structured. It has what IT calls phenomenal distinctions and relations, like a left and the right side. If you imagine waking up from a dreamless nap and seeing your body on your bed, in your bedroom, with a book in your hands, which is blue, there is a lot of structure there. In fact, immense amount of structure is typically not recognized. And all of that structures the experience to be information now specific, the particular way it is. Every experience is specific. There is no experience that's generic. It doesn't make sense for an experience to be generic. The fourth property is integration. Every experience is unitary. You cannot decompose it into independent parts, let's say, the left side experience independently of the right side. It's always one experience. This is a property that was recognized by Descartes himself, as well as, of course, by Kant and others. And finally, exclusion. That is the property by which experience is definite in the Latin sense of having a border, a limit. So what my experience contains when I say come out of this dreamless nap and see my bed, my body, my book, and so on, is what it contains, not less and not more. It doesn't just contain the left side or the right side or the upper quarter. It contains everything it contains and nothing more. It doesn't extend, for instance, behind my back. So every experience not only exists, but it exists for the subject in a structured, specific, unitary, and definite way. Now, the next step that IIT takes, as I mentioned before, is to translate these essential phenomenal properties of experience into essential physical properties, which, where I remind you physical means operational, means cause effect power, with then the prediction that the substrate of consciousness in physical terms should be something that satisfies those properties. Now, the translation takes quite some time to go through, and I will not. Okay, this is explored in several papers, and you know, we are still working on sort of an optimal translation. But basically, if existence in physical terms means cause effect power, taking and making a difference, intrinsicality means that a substrate, a bunch of units you can observe and manipulate, must be able, and I show this here on the left, to make a difference to itself. Okay, and this is the transition probability matrix of a little subset of four units, A, B, C, D. They must be able to make a difference measured here in terms of the probabilities of entering one state from a different state for all possible initial states. Composition means the experience is structured and therefore in physical terms, its substrate must also be structured. So we don't consider just 
A, B, C, D, we consider a subset of it, A, B, C, A, B, B, C, B, C, D, and we get what is called an overall structure of distinctions here in brown and relations. Distinctions are mechanisms with a cause and an effect. It could be mechanism A with a cause within the system and effect within the system. It could be A, B, these are higher order mechanism. And relations are causal overlaps between causes and effects. So you begin to get a structure Information means that the structure is specific, just like experience is. You can't just have a generic distinction, a generic relation. It must be between specific cause state, indicated here, ABC, for instance, a cause state, where the uppercase means on, for instance, and the lowercase means off. And relations might be specific. Some causes must overlap, and if they overlap, they might be congruent. They must specify, for instance, the same cause. Integration means that you take this substrate, you unfold its structure, and then you ask, does it hang together? Is it unitary, like consciousness, or can it be separated into independent components? By this, you do a cut, indicated here by the scissors, you cut out, for instance, unit C, this is a physical manipulation, and you ask, does this make a difference to this structure? If it doesn't, it's not one structure, but two, at least, so it's not integrated. If it does, it means that the structure cannot be subdivided physically into independent components. And the quantity phi is indeed a quantifier of how irreducible that structure is, how much the structure exists as one entity as opposed to as separate entities. Finally, exclusion. Consciousness is definite. It has borders. It contains what it contains, not less and not more at a particular grain. And here the idea is that you could consider any substrate, A, B, C, D, or you can could consider a smaller substrate, like for instance, just these three units, B, C, D, and A is called the background condition, or a larger substrate. In principle, you can unfold in full the causal powers of any substrate, but IIT says that just like consciousness, its physical correspondent must be definite. It must contain what it contains, not less and not more. And the way we go about that is by you know, appealing to the key principle in IIT, the maximum existence principle that says that what exists is what exists the most. So you find the particular substrate that is maximally irreducible. This is called a cause effect structure. In this case, the one that wins is these four units, not three, not five, and so on. And you also find, I won't go into that, the particular grain of the units, be there neurons or micro columns or mini columns, the particular time update, be that milliseconds or microseconds, and the particular set of states that maximize existence, maximize phi. So that's the very quick translation. I just want to point out that uh, finally, recently, this was always a, you know, an important and delicate issue in IIT. We've been able to demonstrate that there is one way of measuring phi, in other words, intrinsic information and then irreducible intrinsic information, which is unique. In other words, it satisfies the postulate of IIT. It's directly derived from the postulate that I just mentioned. And it can be proven mathematically that that is the only measure of making a difference, if you wish, that does so, which is critical if you think about it, because obviously consciousness is what it is. It doesn't depend on how you measure it. And so must be the way we actually evaluate irreducibility in IIT. All of this leads to the fundamental identity of IIT, which I want to point out, is an explanatory identity. From consciousness, we try to account for it in operational physical terms. And the identity says that an experience with all its specific integrated structure is identical in physical terms to a cause effect structure. What I just showed you before, which is composed of distinctions and relations. The quality of the experience, the way the experience feels should be accounted for completely by the distinction and relation that compose the structure, by its form, if you wish. And the amount of consciousness, the quantity of experience, is measured by phi, the measure of irreducibility, which is really a quantifier of existence. And there must be a one-to-one -one correspondence then between the properties of experiences and those of the corresponding cause-effect structures. So now let me just summarize all of this by saying that a cause-effect structure fully unfolds the causal powers of a physical substance in a state, think 
a bunch of neurons, some on and some off somewhere in the brain, based on that operational synchronization, which is the transition polity matrix. And it does so at the optimal unit grain that maximizes existence, phi. It accounts then for the essential properties that are true of every experience, intrinsicality, composition, information, integration, and exclusion. And if the theory is right, it should account also for the specific properties of specific experiences with no further ingredients added. That is for how space feels, time flows, and so on and so forth. In fact, this is very much the research program that is going on in the lab, has been going on for a while. It's not an easy one, I can assure you. But the idea is to try to account from first principles for why space feel extended, time flowing, object as binding the general with the particular, and why colors and sounds and potentially in the end everything else feels that way. I will just mention to give you a sense the you know how we can go about trying to explain the quality of experience, and we did that by starting from the experience of spatial extendedness because it is pervasive. Almost all of our experiences are somehow painted, if you wish, in space, the canvas of visual space. But for that matter, the body also feels extended. Not all, otherwise it would be an axiom, but almost all are spatially extended. This is typically ignored. We take it for granted, OK? And that spatial extendedness, unlike other aspects of experience, like a color or nausea or anything like that, is penetrable by introspection we can, to some extent, understand the structure of spatial experience through introspection, which very much boils down to spatial attention in this case. The idea then is that we need to find a correspondence between phenomenology and the cause-effect structure specified by a particular substrate. We conjecture the right substrate is a grid. Here you see a 2D or a 1D grid of, say, neurons connected by lateral connection, not only, and then we unfold that cause effect structure and we should be able to account for the property of spatial extendedness. No further ingredients added, just the postulates of IIT. And so the phenomenological analysis with for space is doable to some extent to introspection, identifies as basic distinctions for spatial experience, spots for lack of a better word, which are you know, any subset of the canvas of visual space, for instance, or body space that you can sort of focus on. And there are, of course, a huge number of spots of any size, at any location in the visual field, for instance. And then four fundamental kinds of relations among spots. Reflexivity, every spot points to itself. Connection, every spot can have some other spot partially overlapping with it. That's a relation. Fusion, that two connected spot, well, you can always find some spot, which is the fusion of the two. And finally, that for any spot, you can always find a spot that includes it or is included by it. These are really fundamental properties of spatial experience. I'll be happy to discuss that at some you know, other level. But the key point here that I want to get across is then we take our conjecture physical substrate, a grid. Here is a 1D grid for simplicity. We unfold its cause effect powers using just the postulates of IAT. We find irreducible distinctions, which would correspond to the spots, a particular mechanism, say, D, E, two neurons, both off, that specify echoes and an effect that are irreducible, and relations among them. For instance, reflexivity means that echoes and an effect must fully overlap. Connection means that two distinctions partially overlap. So their cause and their effect are partially overlapping, which gives rise to a physical relation that can be measured also in terms of their, its five value, its existence. Fusion, that you can take distinctions and you'll always find one that actually in, is the fusion of the two and vice versa. And inclusion, for every distinction, you can always find another one that either is included by it or includes it. So you do this systematically. Here you just see the few ones illustrated here. And you unfold this large cause effect structure. And you can account in physical terms as substructures for the properties of spatial experience, including all those properties that follow from these four. These four, reflexivity, connection, fusion, and inclusion, we call extendedness. That's what really makes space feel extended. But then there are derived properties, like you experience a region, and that regional space is at a location in space. This has a direct translation in terms of what is called the subtext and the supertext of a distinction 
but it all follows from unfolding the cross effect structure. The size of a spot, the boundary of a spot, or the distance between spots, distances are available to us. We don't need to compute anything. They're all there among any spot in the visual field. All of that exists, so to speak, physically within the cause effect structure. So obviously I cannot hope to go through this properly. It's a long and dense paper, but I recommend that because you will find these things properly described and you know the correspondence properly pointed out. So with that, I want to then briefly go to the fact that as a scientific theory, IAT is actually testable. It has explanatory, predictive and inferential power. To me, the explanatory power actually comes first. For something as fundamental as consciousness, you need to first try to account for many diverse and basic observations with a coherent theory. For instance, you need to um, you know, account for why the cerebral cortex, or at least parts of it, is critical for consciousness. Other parts of the brain that are equally or more complicated, depending how you count it, for instance, the cerebellum has five times more neurons than the cerebral cortex. Why are those irrelevant for consciousness? You take out the cerebellum surgically and consciousness basically does not change, okay? Why are some parts of the cerebral cortex more important than others, as we will see? Why not cortical subcortical loops that are key for, for instance, allowing me to speak now and express what I want to express, but most of what's going on there, I have no idea. Why do those not contribute to consciousness? Why does consciousness vanish early in non-REM sleep, even though the neurons, as indicated here, continue firing at roughly the same rate as they do during wake? Or why does consciousness vanish during some seizures in which neurons fire more and more synchronously than during wake? You need to account for all these facts with a the coherent theory. And I'll give you only a sketch here of the idea that purely based on the postulates of IAT, you can sort of already infer that a substrate like parts of the posterior cerebral cortex where neurons are connected in a grid-like manner and then pyramids of grids stacked upon grids is a very good, very good substrate that when unfolded can accurately specify a giant cause effect structure that is high levels of consciousness you wish of a certain kind. This is just an indication of the grid-like architecture of primary visual cortex, but that's true also in secondary and tertiary visual cortex. And here we see instead that for the cerebellum, despite its massive number of neurons, the fundamental organization of the cortex and the granule cells, you know, Purkinje and the granule cells is according to microzones, which are very much like parallel sheets, very modular, which interact minimally with each other. And that's a terrible architecture for having high phi. If you unfold something like this, you get many, many little mini entities indicated here, millions of them, rather than one big entity. Okay, so that explains why some anatomies are good and some anatomies are bad, at least in the brain, which is the only place where you can test a theory of consciousness. Now, on top of that, I told you that early in non-REM sleep, you lose consciousness. In fact, a third of the time or so early in non-REM, you are unconscious as much as we can tell. If I wake you up, you say there was nothing. The anatomy is still the same. So what changes? Where well, we know a lot about it, neuromodulators change, and what they do ultimately is probably by, you know, making Martinotti cell burst, that's what we suspect based on various experiments with it, but whatever it is, the end result is that the causal interactions within posterior cortex are impaired. There are so-called off periods that break down the cause effect power. So when you're awake, the posterior cortex can specify a giant cause effect structure. When the same person falls into deep sleep early in the night, it's almost like the cerebellum the causal interactions among neurons in posterior cortex break down also elsewhere. And then instead of one big entity, you fragment, you disintegrate, you decompose into many little things. That's sort of the explanation. And that explanation fits with evidence. This is intracranial recordings, intracranial stimulation, intracranial recording, which basically just look here. This is awake and conscious. This is in non-REM sleep early in the night and unconscious. And the response to the stimulus is strong, but in non-REM sleep, there is a period of reduction of the high frequencies here, which basically means that the neurons stop firing, then they come back, but it breaks down, this is the phase locking factor, it breaks down the ability of causes and effects to go across 200 milliseconds or so. So the 
presence and absence of consciousness in very basic cases can be accounted for in a coherent way by the principles of IIT and hopefully also the quality of experience where we can study it. I showed you the first attempt, which has been that of an accounting for why space feels the way it does, that the way it feels extended is a particular kind of cause effect structure in the context of a much larger cause effect structure of the experience. And we conjectured it's specified by grids. Grids do that, account for space, and only grids do that. I will not really explain this slide except for saying a grid-like substrate unfolded satisfy here in gold the properties of extendedness, those four properties of reflexivity, connection, fusion, and inclusion. And similar substrate in terms of number of neurons and connections, but arranged at random, once you unfold it, you get distinctions, you get relations of some sort, but absolutely no extendedness. So you need a particular kind of substrate, a grid, to unfold into a cause effect structure that accounts for phenomenal extendedness. And of course, you know, roughly 38% we calculate of our cerebral cortex is organized in a grid-like manner. It's mostly posterior cortex is organized like that from V1 all the way up. And that is exactly what is needed for supporting an experience which is overwhelmingly spatial like ours. There are experiments too, and there will be more, I hope in the future, that indicate that these grids are important not just to process information as people talk, or you know, they are important to see things. Here is an example of a lady that was studied by you Nomar know, Tafara, in which before the surgery, she was asked to imagine how big a horse was, and in particular, when the horse would overflow her visual field. How close did it have to be? And she basically said 15 feet. It wasn't done just with the horse, it was done with all kinds of things. So that's how large her imagined visual field was, her spatial canvas. They took out one occipital lobe, and of course she became blind on that side, on that hemifield, that is no surprise. But also importantly, when she tried to imagine after the surgery, for her space was basically half of what it was before. The other half did not exist. There is a full agnosia for space, and the horse would overflow her visual field when it was about 35 feet across. Okay, so this is just an indication that the lateral connections in our posterior cortical areas, according to IT, they're not just important for modulatory inference, some kind of fancy processing. They are actually there because they are what make space exist for us. Okay, this is an experiment as a, you know, initial experiment, hopefully there will be more of this ilk, that we did in order to test a rather counterintuitive prediction of IIT, which is that changes in connectivity without ideally changes in activity should change the way experience feels, in this case, spatial experience. So if you strengthen the connections in this little grid, once you unfold it, you get a cause effect structure that will correspond to a more contracted experience of space. And so we used some tricks. We basically used a very rapid flashing of two bright dots at a particular location in the visual field during training. And before and after training, we checked how psychophysically, how far apart two dots presented, for instance, here were from each other compared to other two dots. And so we could do that pre and post training testing. The training is supposed to produce a strengthening of connections indicated here between the corresponding topographically mapped regions in visual cortex, presumably mostly primary visual cortex. And indeed, we observed that for subjects, the two spots presented after training where the connection was stronger looked closer. The most important test is down here. If you stimulate now in two far away regions of you know, the visual field, where you produce no potentiation, no flash, rapid flash, and so on and so forth. So presumably you didn't change the activity patterns that you elicit here when you present the two spots before and after training. All you changed was the strength of the connectivity here in the middle. Even so, as predicted by the theory, space would contract. So this is the kind of experiments, for instance, which are counterintuitive. You change connection strength, you don't change activity patterns to the extent you can actually have that, and the experience will feel different. So I will finish with the predictive power of IT, at least some examples of the predictive power, not just explanatory power, but predictive power. Most of the work that we did from the start was to look at big stuff. When you're conscious versus when you're not, when consciousness is present or not, 
Will some poor man's proxy of phi of integrated information indeed behave as predicted? High when you're conscious, low when you're not. So we developed an approach with TMS EG in which we would measure the complexity of the response across the brain with 60 channels of EG. This was done with Marcello Massimini, who has been continuing this, this line of work. You can see here a complex response in the EG, and here is sort of a compressed version over time. You see many brain regions, cortical regions being involved at different times, typically up to four or 500 milliseconds. The same subject, when unconscious early in the night, the response is much simpler, as you can see here. And in practice, what happens is there is a strong response, but it's only local. It stays there where you stimulate, and it doesn't really propagate anywhere else. It dies off very quickly. Okay, so that was according to the prediction of the theory. And then from then on, you know, more difficult experiment, we tried to see whether when you started dreaming, for instance, in REM sleep, the response should go back to be similar indicating high integrated information to when you're awake. And indeed it did, unlike you know, an unconscious state of sleep. And then anesthesia. Here you see midazolam anesthesia. That was the first set of experiments we did in Madison, then propofol, xenon, and notice ketamine. So these three anesthetics, where the subject is not there, is really gone, led to a response which is not complex as predicted by the theory. The critical one was ketamine because it's an anesthetic, which is not really used in adults now, but it was initially, it produces complete unresponsiveness. You can do surgery, but subjects dream very intensely, which is why it's not used, because it can be also a bad trip, so to speak. But you're conscious, and the response, even if the person is unresponsive, the response of the brain suggests high complexity, high fi This is just to tell you that this can now be done in rodent. These are our data using neuropixel recordings in a rat, and here you see the response, the evoked response, the local field potential, and here the unit, every little dot is a unit firing across the depth of cortex, hippocampus, and thalamus. And you can see that in the cortex, when the animal is in deep non-REM sleep, there is an off period. So we can confirm that units stop firing for roughly 200 milliseconds after the initial response, when the, person, the animal, in this case, in non-REM sleep. For that matter, that's also true for sevoflur and dexflur and dexmetadomidine anesthesia. And it's back in REM sleep. So an index, the perturbational complexity index that quantifies this complexity, is indeed behaving just like in humans, high in wake and REM and low in the other condition. And the reason it's low is because you break causal interactions during the off period in non-REM sleep. By the way, this we also simulated quite some time ago. Now we have more recent simulations. You know, basically we understand reasonably well what's going on in the three layers of cortex, three main layers, supra, infra, and layer four, and then in the thalamus. In sleep, you get this off period, this brief, everybody shuts off, that kill the causal interactions and therefore consciousness. This is just a summary that across hundreds of subjects now, you can see that if you measure this index of integrated information, a very crude index, it's always high, and these are different subjects when subjects are awake, even neurological subjects with uh, locked in syndromes of cortical stroke, cortical strokes, emergence from the minimally conscious state, and importantly, when they are conscious but unresponsive, like ketamine and dreaming, but it's always low when they are in an unconscious situation, non-REM sleep, midazolam, xenon, and propofol anesthesia, with very high sensitivity and specificity, there's really nothing sort of like that. So that was a prediction of IHC, and then it can be used, for instance, vegetative patients, to find out where behavioral responsiveness is not really a, a great guide, whether they may be there or not. If the values are zero, then presumably there is nobody there. The values are low, but like sleep or anesthesia, maybe there is a chance to wake up these people with deep brain stimulation or drugs. And when the values are similar to what we observe in ourselves when we are conscious, there are reasons to believe that these people are there, as we know from other paradigms, and you know, to try to use brain machine interface to communicate with them. I want to finish the IIT part by showing you something that we've been doing for quite a while now. Uh, it's not published yet but it's actually very important when it comes to then possible tests of free will. So here we were trying to get a sort of slightly better measure of phi, more explicitly phi integrated information according to the postulates of IAT, using what is available, which is a seven Tesla and three Tesla data from the human connectome projects, 
on a lot of subjects, these are high quality data. Of course, they don't have the idea of temporal and spatial resolution, but they are already something rather than nothing. And we did, for instance, resting state or tasks. And what you can do, if you do at the voxel level, you can see that you have 32K voxel, 32,000 per hemisphere, and you can approximate with lots of assumptions and approximations, the value of phi. You can literally measure some kind of crude but reasonable proxy of phi. And if you apply, for instance, to posterior cortex as a whole, the values are very high. This is a logarithmic scale. If you apply the same measure to prefrontal cortex and the insula here, it's a particular group of voxels that we might be interested in, the values are much, much lower. If you apply to the cerebellum, they're incredibly low. And importantly, if you apply the measurement to the cortex as a whole, far from going up, they go down. And that is because evidently, while everything is connected and integrated, if you wish, it is not as irreducible, the cortex as a whole, as some parts of it. This is literally, again, what phi measures when it tells you what the borders are of what exists maximally. Okay? And then if you actually go and subject by subject, you find out with an algorithm which is far from perfect and far from comprehensive, essentially based on simulated annealing, what is the set of voxels that is maximally integrated within each su subject? And you plot it across 160 subjects and you say, what are the voxels in the brain? that are most likely to be part of this maximally irreducible set, which according to IIT would be the physical subset of consciousness, or as we call it, the main complex, you see in red and yellow and green here, that is primarily located in posterior cortex. In fact, this is in the resting state, when subjects are just you know, going through their mind without watching or hearing anything in particular. Here's watching a movie. It's very much the same regions, but it extends more, for instance, toward auditory cortex and higher order visual areas. And in fact, this is true also at three Tesla. And here we have data about several different tasks. Again, this main complex, at least probabilistically, is primarily in the back. And notice it has nothing to do with which areas get activated when you are performing the task. When you're performing the task, all kinds of areas, including in the front, can get strongly activated. These are the areas that are maximally integrated of highest phi, according to IIT. So this is a little bit of the footprint of what is the substrate of consciousness in the brain, purely based on first principles, based on whatever is maximally integrated has the highest phi. Now, is that correct? Of course, it is correct if and only if the empirical data about the substrate of consciousness are in agreement. Now, there is no agreement on anything with consciousness, as I suspect you know, but we certainly try to, and there are data in the literature that can be interpreted in the proper way, I think. What we try to do is to develop a within-state paradigm because it avoids lots of pitfalls and confounding factors that are involved when you are using report paradigms, task paradigms, or compare wake to sleep directly or wake to anesthesia, where so many more things change than just consciousness, okay? So our approach was to take the only situation in which we are in roughly the same state, for instance, non-REM sleep, immobile, sort of unresponsive, the brain is showing slow waves and spindles, everything looks sort of the same and you're performing no task, but sometimes, two thirds of the time to be precise, you are conscious, if I wake you up, you report that you were dreaming, and one third of the time, you are not. So we can do a proper within state contrast. And we focus on the last 20 minutes so we can get a good EG correlate of that. And the EG correlate in non-REM sleep is that when you are unconscious, when you're not dreaming a third of the time, there is slow wave activity in the back. We can't be exactly sure about which areas, okay, because it's an average over many subjects, over many dreams, so to speak, but it's primarily in the back. And the slow waves, of course, as I showed you before, are these off periods in which neurons cease firing and they break down the causal interactions in posterior cortex. So that fits with the theoretical predictions. This is REM sleep, which looks radically different on the EEG, but sometimes you don't dream in REM sleep. And when you don't, again, you tend to have slow waves in the back. Now, these are lesion data. And the most classic is the Brickner patient here from the 1930s that was studied for a long time. There was a whole book about him. And then there was, you know, the pathology. 
And in essence, this is a person who had the meningiomas that were producing increased intracranial pressure. And the surgeons at the time took out first the entire left prefrontal cortex, except for Broca's area, and then the entire right prefrontal cortex. You can see what's left here. And clearly, this subject did not have any big problem with consciousness. He was very much conscious as before. The only thing he had is was a personality change and some inflexibility and perseverance, which is what we now call it's a frontal syndrome. At the time, it was actually even argued whether he had a syndrome at all. Hebb and Penfield, not exactly two lightweights, thought that there was nothing wrong with the person, nothing was wrong. And Brickner, the neurologist, has to push to say, no, there is something wrong. And it has to do with personality and some functions, but certainly not with consciousness. By contrast, if you consider both traumatic and uh, lesions and anoxic lesions, when they involve the back, like for instance, much of the posterior corpus callosum and then the regions associated with it, which they generate, then the subject remains unconscious basically forever. The odds of coming out are minimal. So lesion evidence also fits. And this is just one meta-analysis that was recently performed of stimulation data from all over the cortex uh, and the medial temporal lobe in uh, human subjects. And you can see here in red that the areas where you produce some changes, so-called eloquent cortex, and in particular changes in the experience are again primarily in the back. There may be many reasons for it, but in essence, recording studies, lesion studies, and stimulation studies are sort of consistent in saying that the back seems to be particularly important as the subset of conscience, which would fit with this tentatively very high values of five. So I'll finish the first part by just pointing out, which will be important for later, one key implication of IAT with respect to you know, difficult questions about presence of consciousness in other species very different from us, in cortical organoids, or is there such a thing as collective consciousness? The only one I want to point out is computer consciousness. Okay, now with artificial intelligence, especially with artificial general intelligence, we are getting to the stage in which computers are becoming more and more functionally equivalent to us. They can do most of the things we do, sometimes even better. They're not there yet, but the key point that follows from IT, it's an implication very much like the one about free will I will discuss next, is that if IT is right, a computer, a super powerful computer that might even completely simulate in detail the activity of the neurons in my brain by having a precise notion of the connectivity and their properties, will not be conscious at all. This is done with a very, very simple system, A, B, C, D, which we unfold, we see its cause effect powers unfolded here, a cause effect structure with some decent phi volume. And here a much larger physical system of 55 gates as opposed to four, which is actually able to simulate in detail indefinitely the behavior of this system. So this is a computer that simulates this little system, okay? If you consider these two in physical terms as two substrate and you unfold them, you unfold the computer and far from getting a large cause effect structure, you get a bunch of mini, mini entities indicated here corresponding to their memory registers and the clock. And the computer as a whole is nothing at all. It's phi is zero. In this case, because it's fit forward, but it doesn't even matter. It's just the architecture has a bottleneck is very bad for integrating information. So it does all the things this other system does, but it has no intrinsic existence, no consciousness as such. Being is not doing. And so when we get to our own subset of consciousness, let's say primarily in posterior cortical areas, which unfolded would be a giant cause effect structure, as I indicated to you, at least when we are awake or dreaming, a large computer, because it's a computer, that would simulate it, might be able to do all the things we do, but there will be nothing there. There will be nobody home, no consciousness, except for this minimal, minimal set of micro entities corresponding to the re memory registers and the clock, which in the end, you know, leads to the final slide. That is that there is a double dissociation between consciousness and intelligence. Usually we tend to consider them together because there are reasons I won't discuss them now. We actually published a paper on this while with a selective pressure, you might actually get that generally speaking, consciousness and intelligence sort of may grow together. But in general, you could have a supercomputer that is very intelligent and has no consciousness whatsoever, and an organoid in the proper condition that may even be conscious, let's say, of space, but be totally stupid because it cannot do anything. It doesn't even have inputs and outputs. So I'll stop here and take a few questions before then looking at the implications for free will.
Thank you so much, Julio, for this uh, first half of the talk. I'm sure everyone is on their toes waiting for the second half. I know I am. Uh, we have two questions of clarification, which I think are important to uh, answer before we continue. So uh, one is from Adina Roskis asking you to elaborate a bit more about the, about unfolding and explain what that is. Um, and the other is from Nadav Amir asking how does phi differ from other complexity measures in terms of empirical predictions? Okay, well, let me first go with the second question because it's uh, shorter. Okay, so first of all, you know, phi was developed not as a measure of complexity, but as a measure of consciousness. So it satisfies properly done all the zero plus five postulate. It's a causal measure that the zeroth postulate and it is about intrinsic aspects, about specific aspects, structural aspects, et cetera. So it's completely different in that sense, okay? A measure of complexity as such can capture anything you care about. A cerebellum may be wonderfully complex, a pattern of dynamic activity due to, you know, a very, very noisy system can be wonderfully complex. And if you just use those measures, you can have wonderful dissociation. For instance, in IAT, you might have that a grid that is in working order with all the units sort of off, doing nothing, not even changing state, so dynamically is in a fixed point, will have very high phi. Any other measure of complexity, which is dynamic, will find that it has zero complexity, okay? So you have wonderful dissociations like that. Generally speaking, you can sure also find other measures that would reflect the difference between waking and deep sleep or waking anesthesia. But there's, those are not you know, based on the postulates of IIT. That's a quick answer that would be much more to say. Now to Adina's <laughs> question, I really cannot answer your question properly except for you know, sending you back to the papers. But I just use it to say the following, that let's go just to the postulate slide and just say a few more words about it. So in essence, you know, we take a substrate model we imagine we have a bunch of neurons connected in a certain way. Usually our are very simplified neurons where we can observe and manipulate everything we want. We take the system, for instance, these four units, and we take this input and output to extra neurons as a background condition, which means we causally condition them, we fix them. And then we can obtain the transition probability matrix, the TPM that says for every initial state, what is the probability that the system will get into any other state given those fixed background conditions? Okay. And so that is the starting point. The TPM is essentially an ideal summary of this causal substrate. What unfolding does is we can't just take the TPM that contains all that, if you wish, implicitly. We must make the causal powers explicit. And to make them explicit, we not only consider causal powers and the ones that are within the system, not outside that intrinsicality, but we go to composition. So we consider the causal powers of all the parts of the system. A is a part, B is a part, C is a part potentially, A, B is a part, that's composition. So there is a power set that you not need to try out to see whether it has causal powers as a part within the system. You do it for all the parts. And there is causal power also in the relations, meaning, if two mechanisms have a cause or an effect and they overlap, that is an additional causal fact that we capture. It has to be specific. So we actually say, what is the cause? Is it A on, B off, C off, or is it A off, B on, C off? That's for every cause and for every effect. And it only exists, it's only causal, if it cannot be reduced to independent components. If, for instance, what A does within the system and what B does within the system is something, but what A, B together do is nothing above and beyond what A does and what B does, then that doesn't count. That is not a mechanism that has causal power within the system. So we work out all those mechanisms, all the parts of the system that have causal power within, but irreducible causal power. And then the final step in unfolding is we say, okay, we started with a particular candidate substrate, A, B, C, D, but we could have taken A, B, C, A, B, A, B, C, D, E, a much larger substrate, anything, okay? And, but consciousness is definite, it contains what it contains, not less and not more. 
So how do we adjudicate? Okay. And so we find the borders of this entity by unfolding in full, say, A, B, C, D, and asking how much is it, does it exist as an entity? And that's what phi measures, this much. And how much would a subset of it, for instance, A, B, C, exist? Or a superset of it, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever. And the over a subset, the one that exists is the one that exists the most. This is called the maximum existing principle. That gives us borders and automatically excludes anything that is either a subset of it or a superset of it or a paraset, which means it's partially overlapping with it. And so everything which I will show now, it's a good introduction to the next part, everything that is not the maximally existent entity is excluded, okay? So everything condenses down into these maximally existing entities. So if that's okay, because then we can save the questions for later, I will then move to the implications for free will. And I'll call it broadly speaking, the intrinsic existence view because it will be compared briefly to what I think is the more common way to think about everything, including free will, which is the extrinsic existence view. So then I remind you we we'll start from the experience, we finally come up with the idea that to account for the experience in physical terms, we need to fully unfold the substrate and reveal all its causal powers. And we get this global maximum of intrinsic, structure, specific, irreducible cause effect power as dictated by the postulates. The quality is the form, that is all the distinction relations, and the quantity is how irreducible it is. I also you know, discuss, for instance, space. The idea is that any content of an experience, like the extendedness of the visual field, the uh, feeling of time flowing, an object like my body I might be seeing, and the colors, et cetera, et cetera, everything that exists as a content of, a, of an experience exists physically, according to IT. Everything is physical in this very precise way of understanding physics as operational cause effect power. And to be more specific, it is a substructure within the cause effect structure. So if you're having this experience right now, when you wake up from your dreamless nap, then it's a giant cause effect structure indicated here in gray only partially. And within that distinct contents, like for instance, the feeling of extendedness is a substructure and objects will be other substructures and so on and so forth. So here, the key message I want to get across then is that if what exists immediately and indubitably, which I say truly for simplicity, is experience. And if experience has five essential properties, the action of IIT, and if a physical substrate is an operational basis, note, not a supervenience basis, is an operational basis, we can play around with it observe and manipulate, that's all we can do physically, okay? Always as conscious being, by the way, conscious is always first, is a set of units in a state like neurons in the brain. And we fully unfold its cause of causal powers. People normally don't do that. They think about the substrate and then just see what it does. But we want to actually fully unfold its causal powers, which is what IT allows you to do in principle, at least for simple systems. And then the key thing to realize is that what truly exists, what is identical to the experience, is the cause effect structure and not the subject as such. It's a key message to try and get across. We are used to the brain, the neurons, what we observe, manipulate is what exists, and then it carries stuff on top of it. We'll get to that in a moment. But IIT tells you, you know, what exists is the subject unfolded, the cause effect structure, not the subject as such. And so here, I want to give you sort of a, a visual sense of what that means then for any subject, say the brain, okay? IIT requires that you in principle would unfold it completely and it will yield once you do this full unfolding, when you see all its causal powers, one, for instance, giant intrinsic entity, one giant cause effect structure indicated here, sort of like a giant cruise ship, if you wish, surrounded by a huge number of little sailing boats, as it were, which are these mini entities like the cerebellum and probably parts of prefrontal cortex and all kinds of other things. And they are disjoint. None of these entities overlap. What there truly is, if the IT picture is correct, is a bunch of intrinsic entities 
some very large, like our own consciousness, and some very small, like stuff that sort of exists in cerebellum, prefrontal cortex, spinal cord, and everywhere else, so to speak, interacting among themselves. That's just exclusion in action, if you wish. It's called horizontal exclusion because you cannot have overlap between these intrinsic entities. And then there is a vertical exclusion, which I didn't really discuss at length. I only mentioned that we have several papers of that, which says that these entities exist based on units that have a particular grain, a grain like neurons versus micro columns, mini columns, columns, you name it, or anything smaller than that, proteins, atoms, elementary particles. And here it's indicated, for instance, the grain could be neurons. I think this is an open question, one we're actively working on. Is it neurons that have maximal power or is it anything coarser or finer? Is it over 20 milliseconds or two milliseconds or microseconds, probably not, or seconds, tens of seconds, there is going to be one grain and a particular set of states at which intrinsic existence phi is maximum. So there is horizontal and vertical exclusion. What truly exists is a bunch in physical terms, a bunch of intrinsic entities, each of which with substructure with their particular contents at a particular grain, period, okay? Now, what we typically do, which is absolutely fine empirically, is we look at it extrinsically. We can analyze, study physically anything we want, any set, any superset, any subset at any grain we want. We can study the body, we can study the brain, we can study parts of the brain like posterior cortex, we can study the fusiform face area within it. Anything we want, we can study operationally, physically and find cause effect power, of course. And we can do this at the level of neurons, at the level of channels, proteins, atoms, if you wish, or mini columns. Anything is fair as long as you can show physical existence. But that's okay for explaining things, for accounting for things, and that's the domain, of course, of the spatial sciences. But it's not okay ontologically. The principle that matters here, I will not show the others from IIT, follows from the maximum existence principle. It can be called the no free existence principle. Cause effect power cannot be multiplied over the same substrate. So in other words, once we unfold all the causal powers of say posterior cortex, you cannot physically have those powers as well as the powers of the supersets like the cortex, the brain, the body, all on top of it, okay? Or subsets, posterior cortex, but also the causal powers of fusiform face area and also the ones of particular subregions of it there's only a set of disjoint entities. That's the horizontal exclusion. And you cannot physically have coexist the causal powers of neurons if they are the fundamental unit, as well as that of their organelles, their proteins, their atoms, as well as that of the mini columns, voxels and regions to which they contribute. So there is anything you can do is fair, but in the end, what truly exists are only distinct disjoint intrinsic entities at a particular grain. That's the intrinsic existent view versus the extrinsic existent view. And now here we come to the ontology, so to speak, that's relevant also for free will. So this whole story says that when I am conscious or whatever, I exist intrinsically as a cause effect structure in physical terms, not as a substrate. And of course, only I exist, not my subset, supersets or parasets, and at the grain at which I exist, not at finer and coarser grains. Now, anything that's the content of my experience also truly exists, but it exists physically as a substructure within a cause effect structure. That's true for space, time, objects, and colors that I might experience. It's true for thoughts and feelings. It's true for alternative reasons, decisions, will, intentions, agency, self, valuably, you name it. Problems, solutions, question, answers, anything you might think of. So what I indicate here are different experiences, so to speak, that you might have at different moments, which is what exists, and within it, different contents, okay, that have that particular shape. And perhaps the most important message here for this part about sort of the freedom as opposed to the will, if we go back to our sort of paradigmatic free will scenario, a very, very crucial step in my mind is the existence of alternative courses of action. The moment I, in a typical deliberative process, I think to myself, 
consciously, I could do this or that, which is a typical thing, where that could also be not this, it doesn't matter. What is that? Well, IIT tells you that what there is, is an experience which truly exists as a cause effect structure. And within it, indicated here by these sort of two silly horns in yellow and in green, are two substructures related among themselves that only exist as intrinsic content of experience. They are substructured, they are physical, and they are the only alternatives that are worth their name. The alternatives that exist in my mind. That is where freedom resides. And it does not reside in alternative traje trajectories of a substrate unrolling over time, as is normally thought. They don't exist. The substrate as such does not exist. At any moment, all that exists is this. That's what truly exists. Consciousness as a physical cause-effect structure. And these hypothetical trajectories that we can conceive, whether we introduce or not in determinism, are neither necessary for true freedom, because they don't exist, nor are they sufficient. Because if there is some alternative at the micro level, because of indeterminism, it merely introduces essentially chance and not really any freedom. So you can sort of see here, remember this, it's a vertical alternative between two possible courses of action in your mind, not a horizontal alternative as what the substrate might be doing. There is no such thing as the substrate, but only the substrate unfolded. So then the same holds true for reasons. When I consult my reasons consciously, basically those exist again as substructures within a cause effect structure, as contents of my experience, and they exist physically. So that's what exists, and that is what is instrumental in leading to a decision. A decision is also a substructure in my experience, and the decision is, of course, going to be followed by an action, typically, and usually also by another experience, which is, of course, the feeling of agency, typically associated with control. So this, in short, is a very, very quick and you know, sketch of how the ontology of IAT applies to the situation of free will. What truly exists are experiences, and these are cause effect structures, and within them, all kinds of contents, space, faces, colors, you name it, but also alternative courses of action, reasons, and decisions. And they truly exist and only exist at, as forms in the mind. Now, this leads me, I told you in the ontology, but you also need an account of causation. Otherwise, you get sort of the freedom, but you don't get the will. Okay. For that, you need to answer the question of what caused what. And this has been the focus of our efforts for quite some time now, to try to get a proper mathematically coherent way of measuring what causes what. It's called causal structure analysis. In essence, I'll go very quickly here too, is based on the same postulates of IIT, because after all, cause effect power is about existence, and what causes what is tightly related to it. Instead of existence here, you have realization. To measure actual causation, what cause what, you need two occurrences. An occurrence at time t minus one, say a system in state A, B, C, D, some on, some off, and then another occurrence that actually happens at time t zero, for instance, this one, in which you see D turns off, for instance. And then you can ask in this transition between two occurrences, which actually happened, okay, what caused what? And in IIT, just like intrinsicality required that the cause effect power be inside, for actual causation, you must look in both directions, which is typically not done. You can ask what are the causes from the occurrence at T0, the cause at T minus one, and you can ask what are the effects of t minus one to t zero. And they are not typically the same. So you need to analyze both directions. And you do the analysis compositionally. That is, you should ask not just for the cause of A, B, C, D, or just of A, which would be like the holistic or reductionist approach. You have to ask for the causes of C, of D, of C, D, and so on and so forth, and their relations. You have to ask precisely what cause what and get a quantity and measure of the efficacy of causation. And it's only causal if the cause is irreducible. If A is caused by something and B is caused by something and they are caused independently, there is no joint cause. And you can measure this explicitly again with the tools of IIT. The quantity in this case is called alpha and not phi, and it's measured 
quite precisely. So we can tell if there is an irreducible cause and that's the only cause that matters. And finally, we can also apply exclusion and ask, well, does the cause include everything, including all the cosmic rays that may be happening now that sort of were also involved in causing an accident or, you know, for a neuron, it fired because of the input through all its thousand synapses as opposed to the three that fire very strongly. There is a principal way to answer that. You find what causes the most, and that is what in the end the causal structure analysis gives you, a principal way to measure what caused what. Again, I refer you to the fundamental paper, which is this one, uh, which is providing all the fundamental examples for this. It allows you to take, for instance, a little agent, this is called an animat with sensors, effectors, and a little brain, and explicitly work out all the causes and their strengths, all the effects and their strengths, alpha, and provide, therefore, a causal account of a transition between two occurrences. This causal analysis is moving on. Uh, it's not finished yet, but we have made at least some progress in attacking in a principled way questions like, are there macro causes versus micro causes? And again, the IIT approach says that macro causes can exclude micro causes. That is, there is macro causation, depending on how the system is built, that exclude micro causation. This is the opposite of, you know, Kim's notion of causal exclusion being microphysical causation is what causes the rest is carried along. No, you can show once you have an actual measure of causation that macro units can cause and not the micro units. The macro beats the micro, we call it. Um, importantly for free will too, you can backtrack causes. I won't show the video here and everything else, but it's just basically the idea that you can ask meaningful the question of given an occurrence, we can backtrack in time when the distal cause actually was and beyond which instead there was no distal cause, again using a criterion of maximality. So we can actually track what caused it and how far in the past, okay, that's backtracking. More generally, you can use this analysis, I won't explain the figure on the left, the paper in press, but causal structure analysis connects sufficiency accounts of causation in philosophy to counterfactual and probabilistic accounts, that is interventional accounts, uh, the counterfactual ones, and extends naturally to any probabilistic or non-binary scenario. It can account, as we show in that paper, for many, many philosophical puzzles of causation. The moment you put them in these precise mechanistic terms, you can actually get a meaningful answer to most of the classic examples. To me, very importantly, it demonstrates the incoherence of causal reductionism, or the idea that's sort of permeating sort of much of our thinking in general, that what really causes micro events at the micro level. No, actually the exclusion goes the other way. There is high order causation, there is macro causation. And finally, it provides a coherent account of the difference between causation and prediction. I won't go into that now, but it'll come back when we get now to the final point about free will. And that is the sentence that sort of captures the most important implication that sums together the ontology and the causal structure analysis part, that only what exists can cause, where of course I mean truly exist as an intrinsic entity, only what truly exists can truly cause. That's the final real message of the IAT approach to consciousness and its implication for free will. Remember this. So at any moment, there is an experience which has contents, which could be alternatives, reasons, and then finally a decision. Now, a decision is a substructure within a cause of structure, is a physical thing. Now we can ask, in principle, if we have the right tools, what caused my decision? And here it is enlarged. It will typically be an alpha structure, a causal account, the way I sort of briefly described to you, which will connect some substructure within an intrinsic entity here, this cause of extractor, which is my decision now, to its causes in a previous, so to speak, experience or state of mind. And particularly, it will connect it also in part to reasons which are also physical, they are substructures. So you can actually measure what caused what my decision by which reasons within my experience. All of this truly exists and it has an actual strength, alpha, of causation. You can also measure in the effect direction, what did my decision cause? Language is unfortunately very confusing about this. What are the effects of my decision on, for instance, the action that I might perform? And again, only what truly exists can cause. This truly exists, this substructure and my decision truly exists, that can actually 
course, we can, in principle, measure that and then attribute you know, the true cause and the true effect. I want to remind you now, just to give a very quick snapshot of what difference this makes. Before I showed you the false from IIT, that a computer that were able to simulate my brain in detail will do everything I do, but it will be nothing whatsoever. It will be not conscious. It would not be an intrinsic entity. And here I'm showing you, so to speak, a computer that is simulating my decision and the previous state of my brain when I was sort of going through my reasons and the subsequent action, if you wish. So in principle, a computer could do all of that, but it doesn't exist as a whole. There are just micro entities only. At any time point, does it exist? And therefore, it doesn't truly cause. All the true causes here are just trivial, say, transistor to transistor causes, a bunch of them, and not entity to entity causes or substractor to substractor causes. So it doesn't exist. It exists for us, but not for itself. It doesn't exist intrinsically, truly. And it doesn't cause, truly. It's as if it existed from the outside. It looks like one of us. And it's as if it had free will and caused. But none of that is true once you have your ontology and causation correct. So I want to show you this slide, which of course is a parody of what probably many people might think. It doesn't really necessarily capture anybody's specific notions, I'm sure not in this group, but there is this overwhelming sense that we carry with us that after all, the physical substrate, like the brain, the neurons, and ultimately the elementary particles exist down there as the supervenience basis or the grounding for everything else. And then there is microphysical causation such that we go from here to here to here and then to an action. And then everything else, well, obviously, except for you know, strict atomists, we do think it's important. We don't think that it's not there, we shouldn't talk about it, but it's due to essentially vertical determination, if you wish, a kind of supervenience in which you can talk about anything you want, including here functional state one that might correspond to I could do this or that, which of course is vertically determined. And it's carried along for the ride. That's the best way to put it. This exists. These may exist too in some sense. Maybe they're not physical, but we cannot do without them for explaining who we are, what we do, and what causes what. But really, in the end, the bottom is carrying the day. Okay, And so we go from here to here to here, and this continues to exist in the usual way of seeing things. And all the supervening stuff is there. We cannot help talking about it because, of course, there's multiple realization and many other reasons. We cannot do anything but giving causal explanation at this level. It doesn't make sense otherwise. But truly, down deep, so to speak, is the microphysical substance and the microphysical causation that carries the day, as opposed to the intrinsic existence view that the substrate doesn't exist. Once you unfold it, what exists is just the cause effect structure, the conscious entity that exists and causes. So I will now finish. I know it's been a lot. This will be easier in a way. I want to just make one point about the role of indeterminism. I'm not going to go at all into compatibilism versus incompatibilism, but I will just say, because it's important, that IIT actually requires indeterminism from first principles. So to exist, you must have, you know, cause effect power, that is intrinsic structure specific unitary indefinite. We saw that, and then you exist as a cause effect structure. But to have cause effect power intrinsically, you actually, even as an elementary unit, whatever that might be, in this case, obviously not a neuron, but an atom or an elementary particle, you must have a way to take and make a difference to yourself intrinsically. You must make a difference, otherwise there is no causal power. And you must have at least two states available to you, always present, available intrinsically. Otherwise, again, you cannot take a difference. So in essence, there is a trade-off between determinants and indeterminants, which is mandated by the requirements for existing in IIT. And it's interesting, you actually get some mathematical value for exactly what is the right value of indeterminants to maximize existence. So there has to be indeterminism, by the way, which means, of course, that the future is open-ended, also according to IIT and not just to sort of modern physics, and the past is not predetermined. The two main points I want to sort of still make is, what about predictability? I told you that causal structure analysis distinguishes clearly between causation and predictability once you, you know, characterize causation properly. 
What about short-term predictability and free will, which is a scenario in which indeterminism probably doesn't play a big role. You are in a closed room with a computer screen, performing a task of judging, for instance, somebody or something out of your own free will for a minute. And you know it's relatively predictable. Indeterminism should not be very important. Now, of course, we know that in a situation like this that comes up in such discussion, it is of course true that somebody who knew me very well might indeed figure out what I'm going to do, predict what I'm going to do. And in this case, this is not at all a problem for free will, this high level predictability, because the person who knows me very well essentially knows or has incorporated in her own mind my reasons. And therefore, because she knows my reasons, she can also predict what my reasons will cause and what my decision will cause. So, she better be able to predict high level what I do because it is due to my reasons. Those are the true causes. More interestingly is the case of low level predictability that we saw sort of before. And I'm using here as the only reference to this group. I'm sorry and apologize to everybody else, but you can see I couldn't really go in any further depth, but at least this, okay, the donation paradigm. Imagine you're closed in your room, you're going through the donation paradigm and you slowly decide based on your own free will in a deliberative setting to whom you want to donate the money okay and you just do it now imagine again we're certainly far from there this is the blue brain project supercomputer that we're able to know everything about your neurons how they are connected and what state they are in and at least for a short time it should be able to predict pretty well exactly what you're going to do there's no reason why not and it's going to do it indeed potentially faster than you do it, giving you this sense of alienation. You know, it just got everything I did. So what am I doing here? So that's all understandable. But if IIT is right, this is absolutely not a problem for free will. A substrate that the computer is using is a shortcut. What you really can do if it is a good substrate is unfold it, find out what exists, the experience and account for all the properties of the experience, which is the goal of IIT as well as for what causes between two different experiences, for instance. That is a gigantic effort, of course. The poor computer wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do it. It's an impossible task. But leaving that aside, we can, however, take a shortcut. We don't care to figure out what exists and what causes truly, but we can just check unit by unit what's going to happen next to that unit, to which neurons say, will it fire or not? And so we get a prediction. If the model of what exists and causes is good, the prediction should be good. But prediction is not a causation. And my last point will be this. So what does this entail with respect to now the longer term story of historical determination, this feeling that we often have that no matter what, sort of we are determined by what happens to our genes, to our environment, to our life experiences and so on and so forth, okay? And where does personal responsibility then come into this picture? So here I give, just again as an illustration, a view that some people certainly hold, which is obviously discouraging, in which from the Big Bang on, so to speak, is just one damn thing after another. You know, this determines this, which determines that, which determines that, there may be some indeterminism in, here and there, but essentially, inevitably, what follows, follows what was before in a way that could be predicted, for instance, to some extent. In any case, it's a long chain of determinations. And therefore, in this view, in some sense, nothing is ever truly my responsibility, but is determined by previous occurrences and to some extent chance. Now, I'm sure you have discussed this at length and there are ways to sort of think about this, but for sure it's a lingering thought. What does IIT have to say? It has to say that the story is radically different. The intrinsic existence view says that my decisions are truly my responsibility and increasingly so with self-forming actions and rationality. And just, I illustrate this by saying that what truly exists, again, according to IT, is not the substrate. At first, it's just this, what I call dust, possibly many, many micro entities with minimal values of phi's that count for nothing, okay? That's the universe at the beginning. Then consciousness, this is the first big discontinuity, emergence at a high level. And here I mean emergence just in the temporal sense. Suddenly there is, some big entity like this primitive fish or primitive mammal where there is true existence and the baby of course would be possibly even more true existence so there is consciousness something exists rather than nothing and exists a lot as measured by phi 
The second big discontinuity is when at a certain age, it's typically a gradual process, you actually have contents within consciousness, substructures in the cause effect structure, corresponding to alternatives, reasons, and therefore, you know, willed decisions. Then for the first time, you truly have free will. This free will is there. So you are, by the account I gave you, acting on your own free will. Now or later, it's your decision, but it's still largely, largely devoid of responsibility. The free will acts on something that was largely determined by what happened before, so to speak. It's then when you begin to have self-forming actions, I don't mean in strictly in the sense of Cain, but more, you know, going back to Aristotle, if you wish, in which you decide that you want to learn medicine because you want to help the world and help other people, okay? You do that, of course, you're going to change all kinds of things, including things in your brain. You're going to change the substrate and therefore change what exists. And the more this accrues, the more of your own free will, your responsibility increases because you are a consequence and effect of your free will. And when you're an adult doctor, for instance, then not only do you have hi-fi and a high you know, level of consciousness and all the reasons and the beliefs and the understanding that you have, with it comes high responsibility because now you have been responsible for who you are. And finally, to me, the last discontinuity is the one in which when you also get hold of rationality as a method, the method to examine your reasons and beliefs in an impartial manner, of course, aided by a society and by science, as opposed to as what was determined by your past, you really become fully and truly free and you really become truly and fully responsible. So I will end, I promise, now this is the end, by saying these are lots of words you wish, lots of issues, but it is still a research program and it is open to empirical tests. So what we are trying to do is use animals, these little things where we can actually measure everything accurately, animals interacting with an environment to just measure these things, what exists and what causes. Of course, these animals don't have reasons and they don't have beliefs, but you know, one day they might get there. But ultimately what can, I think in principle be done is in terms of human experiments, ask the kind of question you have been asking you know, about involuntary and voluntary actions, small and big decisions that I call them, libet style, trivial, if you wish, or arbitrary and deliberate decisions and look indeed at the brain. And in essence, you know, whether it's a reflex or a TMS induced movement or a sort of trivial decision or a deliberation, the questions become in principle tractable. If this say were the main complex, the overall of substrate of consciousness which unfolded corresponds to what you experience, including when you are making a decision. Can we identify the tentative borders of this main complex as we tried to do, as I showed you before, when we are leading up to a reflex or a libid style or a deliberate action and measuring its phi and its borders? Once we have its borders, is it the case that voluntary actions as IT would predict but not reflex actions originate within the main complex, that is the part that's conscious. And we should be able to measure the alpha, the value of actual causation between for instance, motor cortex and the main complex compared to elsewhere. Can we backtrack in time the actual cause of a voluntary action, the distal cause where, it, where the buck stops, so to speak, the decision. And that's again is made precise by in principle by the causal structure analysis. And finally, is it the case that alpha, as we would predict, is higher and the substract within the mind complex is larger when you are making a deliberate decision, triggering a deliberate action versus a libet style action? So I'll end there and thank my collaborators for free will, especially Larissa Albantakis, Melanie Boli, Kelsio Eli Matteo Grasso, Billy Marshall, and Christoph Kaur. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julio. This has been really thought-provoking and intriguing. I feel that every two, three slides would have merited a discussion of uh, several meetings even. Um, so first of all, thank you again very much. And uh, I, I really wonder what our philosophers have to say about these ideas. I see one question in the chat, but maybe others would uh, probably have questions as well. I just wanted to have a first question to make sure uh, I understood correctly that we are all on the same page. So when you say that only um, what exists can cause, you mean exist for me, exist in intrinsically. And this is like the critical point of your argument, I think, 
is that the reason why we deny free will is that we look at the system extrinsically. And then we look at these vertical causation and so on and so forth. But um, from your perspective, the only thing that matters is what exists for me in my consciousness. And that's the realm where you um, examine uh, causation. D did I get it right? Yes, you did. But the, an important thing I want to, thanks for putting it like that, okay? It's clearly the critical point with respect to free will and many other things, including meaning, of course. But what I want to convey with these two slides, the intrinsic existence view and the extrinsic existence view, okay, which is this, okay. I'll, let me start again with the extrinsic existence view. This is the one we take as people. I'm looking at the glass on my table and the mouse on my computer and so on and so forth. And operationally, I see that it is physical. I can take and make a difference. Okay, that's the criterion for physical existence. Otherwise, if you cannot prove that a Higgs boson takes and makes a difference, your colleagues will not believe it truly exists, okay? But that's the extrinsic view. And this can be applied to anything that takes and makes a difference. In the case of the brain, it's easy. You can ask the body, the body plus uh, our tools for people who think about extended cognition. You can talk about the entire brain or just the cortex or just the posterior cortex, as I say here, or just one area. You can do whatever you want and you can do it at whatever grain those are all legitimate, they're absolutely fine, okay? And some of these things we can study extrinsically, I call them, this is a whole other story, extrinsic entities, they hold together well, they are actually very integrated, they are also local maxima, meaning most subsets and supersets are less integrated. A body is like that, my body is pretty well integrated, it's sort of the paradigmatic organism, okay? And it holds together well, but if IIT is right, it's not a global maxima. It doesn't satisfy all the post bits until the very end. So the key thing that IIT says is it's fine to analyze, analyze, or even in real life or in science, anything you can observe and manipulate and say it exists, of course, okay? But this is from the perspective of a conscious observer, extrinsic. The claim is that consciousness, which exists truly, and by that I mean as the Cartesian insight, that is nothing else, okay? Immediately and indubitably, and it is from within consciousness that we can then postulate all these reasonable things, there's stuff apart from me, that stuff is physical and maybe atomic, but consciousness is the only thing that is the proof that there is something rather than nothing, that something has these five properties of existence. And so the idea is that even in physical terms, consciousness tells us what it takes for something to truly exist where to truly exist means to exist intrinsically. You must be able to exist for yourself as a you know, structure specific unitary and definite entity. Without that, it doesn't make sense. You don't exist. If I am on my bed, I am awake, I see my body as I showed you many times, and then suddenly I fall into deep sleep, okay? From the extrinsic perspective of somebody looking at me, I'm there just as much. From the intrinsic perspective, nothing exists as far as I'm concerned, I'm gone. From the outside, it's basically the same, almost the same. But the outside is always some conscious subject, by the way. From the inside, there is nothing. And I think we all understand that, that if you don't have consciousness, nothing truly exists as far as each of us is concerned. So there is a direct sense in which we know that that's the only existence that matters. The only, I, I call it existence worth having or the only kind of entity worth being, okay? That's how I would put it. That is what truly exists. Interest, in, interestingly, this is a thing that can be tested scientifically. We can check whether indeed consciousness is this maximum or cause effect power. If that turns out to be true, then its metaphysical consequences have to be taken seriously, in fact, scientifically. And one of the consequences is this intrinsic view that then we should consider the subject not at any level we want, we can still do that, like in this view, or any subject we want, but really ultimately it condenses down into a bunch of things that truly exist, exist intrinsically for themselves, plus their extrinsic interactions at one particular grain. It's a radically different view, if you wish, of what is out there. Yeah. Okay, but thank it's you. A view oh, that sorry. Testable sorry. and consistent with science. So I'll, I'll stop, but thanks for the question.
Thank you very much. Um, so we would uh, give priority to questions about free will, although there are many questions about consciousness in general, which of course makes sense given uh, the interest that this uh, theory evokes. So maybe we can start with Tim's question uh, on the chat until we go next. And I also invite the others, if you have questions that specifically relate to the free will account, then uh, that would be great. If not, we resort back to, to consciousness questions, which are always interesting. Uh, so Tim, please go ahead. Yeah, so let me pose my question this way, because I was actually a little unclear um, what you were arguing with respect to whether there are or might be alternative possibilities for actions. Uh, so that's uh, around that slide that you had up uh, when you were talking yeah, with okay, God. Yeah. Uh, you had up the one with the two horns, uh, uh, and then you 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 said that um, alternative possibilities exist in my mind as distinct thoughts when I deliberate, and that's of course true. Uh, but you seem to deny that they exist as real world possibilities. Um, and I guess my comment uh, question is this: uh, I mean, of, of course, alternative actions don't exist as actual events. Uh, there is just one fully determinate actuality, um, but multiple possibilities in the world, behavioral possibilities, uh, if there are such, are would be latent in the actually existing powers of objects or systems. So, you know, it, it boils down to how causal powers interact and whether or not when they do so, they leave open one more than one trajectory uh, to be the outcome. Uh, so any rate, I, I would, my, my question really is just to ask you to clarify, were, were you wanting to deny uh, as a kind of conceptual matter that there, there were multiple possibilities uh, for behavioral actions? Um, I, I was unclear because then some things you went on to say later, uh, you seem to come down strongly in favor of indeterminism. So it just, I was a bit confused about the view you, you were uh, advocating. Yeah, no wonder. Thanks again for, you know, forcing me to clarify this a bit more. Okay. So let me just say again, what you noticed that IIT in one sense is incompatible with determinism. And that is incompatible from first principles because this intrinsic existence requires indeterminism. In order to exist, you must have cause effect power inside. And that requires not only that you can make a difference to yourself, but there is a difference to be made. Okay. That's a much longer conversation. But, you know, of course, you can say modern physics suggests that something like this is indeed the case. But there are multiple interpretations of that, it's still open. This is saying it should be the case even from first principles, just in terms of ontology, okay? That's an important consequence that says there can't be determinism in IAT if as an ontology we take it seriously. This of course has also consequences, that's the indeterminist part again, in terms of predetermination and the open-endedness of the future. In the long run, of course, because IAT requires indeterminism, it also implies that the future is open and the past is not, was not determining what was going to happen next, okay? This is completely independent of issues of predictability, like can a system predict itself, incompleteness and all of that, that's on top of it, okay? So I think, and it sounds to me like on this, we certainly agree, IIT just comes to this indeterminism from an ontological perspective, okay? Then it, the question becomes, okay, what about these alternative trajectories? So if the world were deterministic, there are no alternative trajectories, period, okay? And, but the world is not, at least not according to modern physics and certainly not according to IIT, deterministic. So in some sense, there are possible alternative trajectories that we can describe, and they are truly, to some extent, indeterminate. And of course, you have discussed much more than I could do here, how important that is, does it percolate to macro levels? Does it matter for the brain, the kind of indeterminism that we assume is there or not? So those are all important questions. And I do assume some degree of indeterminism. But the key aspect of IT here, the one that's different, is that there is an ontology that says that the only thing that truly exists, and I really mean it, when I say that, I say, the brain does not exist as such, okay? What exists is these intrinsic entities, some very big, like you and me, and some presumably ridiculously small, like when I've decomposed into deep sleep or anesthesia, and much of the rest of my brain and my body, you know, is presumably 
doesn't have the right anatomy and doesn't have the right physiology. That's at least the testable hypothesis from IAT. So it's really does exist minimally, although when it exists, it exists intrinsically. So what there is really is this giant cruise ship, as I showed it, or giant star, you know, whatever metaphor you want, that's truly there. And the interesting part here, I'm trying to get across the image, is that it exists physically. It's not some kind of a ghost or so, physically in the operational sense. What truly exists is my experience, period. But operationally, it can be accounted for with physics, taking and making a difference. And as such, you need to really know what exists. And it's a giant monster. Even an empty screen, according to IT, is fantastically rich. It's an immense structure of distinction relations physically. People think not because they think they can describe it in two words. But two words is just conveying it to another person who already has space in their mind. Okay, So all of that. So now think about this ridiculous little picture. This was unfolded from a system of eight units, <laughs> binary units. In our case, it's going to be a little bigger than that, Okay, monstrously bigger than that. And it has a particular shape that, again, ludicrously I depict as two horns. Okay, Or let's call it a fork on the high road. That's another way I could put it. Okay, That truly exists. If you were to go and ask physically what's there, that's what's there, not the brain. That is what's there, the unfolded thing. And that is the only sense in which alternatives exist. My neurons don't have alternatives. My atoms don't have alternatives. They might follow alternative trajectories, depending, but they don't have alternatives. I have alternatives. And only when those come into being do alternatives exist. One way to put it is to say that the first time, I don't know, I don't want that, that was, somebody thought of, I could do this or I could do that, did alternatives occur, come into being in the history of the universe. And of course, the first time, it, you know, a little boy or girl has that thought, I could do this or that, and possibly why this and why that, then alternatives, reasons came into being. Before that, there was literally nothing of the sort. Okay, So I know it would take longer. I would <laughs> love to have a longer conversation, but let's just go to other okay. questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you both. Um, Till, with your permission, I'm going to ask another question from the Q&A first, because it, se it seems like it's directly related to this one. So Randolph, Randolph Clark asks a question about alternatives. Sometimes in deliberation, I consider an alternative that unbeknownst to me is not really open to me. And sometimes I have alternatives that I fail to consider. Is your view of the existence of alternatives consistent with this observation? There was a little hitch I didn't hear the question. It's just the second part, I guess. Can you okay. say it again? Yeah, sure. So uh, the question mainly is sometimes in deliberation, I consider an alternative that unbeknownst yep. to me is not really open to me. And sometimes I have alternatives that I fail to consider. Is your view of the existence of alternatives consistent with this observation? So, do, uh, okay. if I okay. So, you, okay. Good. Yeah. So, if you know, the first towns are like a Frankfurt style scenario or something like that. And uh, a, the second sounds like that I don't have even had the ability to conceive of that alternative, although in principle it would be possible, right? So, again, if you take this picture, first of all, the Frankfurt style scenario doesn't count. Okay, I mean, it has been used in order to say that, of course, there can be free will without alternatives. But in reality, there is always an alternative in my mind in a Frankfurt style scenario. I can do this or not. Unbeknownst to me, I couldn't possibly carry it out because of the evil neurosurgeon. Okay, but that in this scenario doesn't meet, matter at all because the only alternative that matters are the one in my mind. And I do have it in my mind when I consider it. Okay. And conversely, an alternative that does not exist in my mind, that would be say unconscious, or I never developed that notion because I don't have the right values and the right beliefs, for instance, that truly does not exist for me. It just doesn't, okay? So, and therefore it cannot possibly cause. So if I act based on, let's say that I present you with a priming experiment and I, there is an arrow pushing me to press the right button and I'm completely unaware of it, but I do follow this arrow, would you say, what would be then the cause of me pressing at the same direction as the arrow? So this is exactly the kind of thing that would be interesting to study empirically, just to you know go back to the, the last slide, let me just go there. 
I didn't spend time on elaborating on the kind of experiments. But so if there is an unconscious influence, for instance, assuming that the priming is sort of unconscious, that does actually lead to an action that may not even be the one that they initially had in mind or something like that, you can concoct all kinds of scenarios, there would be a precise prediction. The prediction would be that the uh, cause, the actual cause of the action will turn out to be something which is outside the main complex or partially at least outside the main complex. And more than that, it would have a very low alpha value. That is the amount of causation is much less. As opposed to, I do this because I think this foundation deserves the, all the support it can get. And then it's going to be the actual cause will be my reasons and some other aspect of my values and myself and so on and so forth. So it would be inside and will have a very high alpha value. Now this is not easy to measure, okay? But in principle, it is measurable and it would be testable, okay? And then you could really assign responsibility accordingly. Very interesting, thank you. Uh, Till, go ahead, please. Yes, yeah, so thank you for a very rich talk. So this is a bit of, almost a follow on from the ads question. So suppose we just make this a bit more complex now and suppose there's something like a weighing of reasons if that could happen unconsciously. Um, you know, you might think of it like a computer. I suppose a computer weighs reasons, obviously not real existence, not intrinsic existence, but it does has seems to have a, a simulation of what we are doing. Um, so would you think, so A, do we know, can, is there a, an easy way to differentiate between intrinsic um, causation um, by reasons and extrinsic causation by reasons, or is it not being caused by reasons? Could that not happen unconsciously? What, what, what would you say? So, you know, several things. So in, again, it's all in principle or in very simple scenarios like, like our little animats where we can measure these things precisely. Okay? Otherwise you have to make assumptions. But generally speaking, first you need to find the intrinsic entities, this global maxima, okay? According to this principle. So basically measure their phi, measure their border, see what's inside, see what their grain is. Then you have to measure what caused what, if you're interested in a particular occurrence, like I did this, I, you know, I pushed this button, etc. cetera. And in, you can also measure things like which reason led to the decision, okay? Or which reasons led to the decision. And you can, with this actual causation framework, essentially measure, for instance, this strength alpha by which this reason influenced the decision this other reason and this other reason. So you can literally, in principle, measure, give a way to the weight to the particular actual causes of a decision. And you find the maximal cause. Then you can filter these actual causes by if they come from an intrinsic entity or a substructure within it, like a conscious reason, then it truly causes in the sense of IoT. Otherwise, what truly causes are small things that cause other small things as I showed you with the computer example, okay? There is no point in talking about reasons. The only reasons that exist are the ones that are substructures within a cause effect structure. Now, one important thing that follows from this, I don't know if it was implied by your question, but it's something that nevertheless I would like to say, is that it follows that if you want your reasons to be the actual cause of your decisions, not only do you want your reasons to be, you know, important aspects of your experience, but you actually want to make them as explicit within consciousness as possible. You want to be clear about your values, you want to be clear about your motives, you want to be clear about your reasons. And by clear, I don't just mean clear, I mean really make them explicit in your experience, because only that way, I like to call it the tribunal of consciousness, okay? only when they are fully there exposed in the tribunal of consciousness, can they be the true cause and the strong cause. If you let it sort of vaguely fluctuating there between, so to speak, consciousness and unconsciousness, then the cause of your action may turn out to be a strange mixture, a weak mixture, and it's not really yours. So make your reasons, your values, and your beliefs as conscious as possible, which is not a new idea, really but it sort of gives it a precise meaning. Gabriel. Thank you very much, uh, Julia, for a fascinating talk. I'll need several uh, months, if not years, to digest it all. Um, I want to understand one of the last slides. 
do you understand correctly that you're claiming that a one-year-old or a two-year-old does not have free will? And furthermore, I've always thought about free will in a binary fashion, yes or no, but I, I thought you were saying that there's a progression in the development of free will so that a 10-year-old has more free will than a five-year-old, a 20-year-old more than a 10-year-old. Am I understanding correctly what you're saying here? Okay, so let me first say this, of course, is a cartoon. And I have no idea, you know, exactly how much consciousness there is and how much free will there is going to be because to actually do that then in this sort of scientifically testable way, you would actually have to measure it, which is not impossible. If you do what we try to do with all its limitations in adults and finding the main complex, we could do this at different ages, basically, you know, with high resolution MRI and get some, you know, sense of it. Or the other way around, this I think is a useful comment also for consciousness in general. Once you validate these things more and more, it just follows that, for instance, if you have a connectivity like you have in V1 at birth, at least in, in mice, for instance, as well known, where there are no lateral connections yet. Uh, there is only thalamocortical and cortical phenomenal connections. So units fire, but they don't interact. There is not going to be any decent consciousness there. When the connections are random, that's bad too. It's only when you start having this pattern, you know, patchy connectivity, then you can have some, for instance, spatial consciousness and then more on. So there are lots of interesting inference you can make based on a theory of when consciousness is there and what kind of consciousness. Beyond that, I don't know. So if, you know, the question is what, how much consciousness is there at different ages? And then when do true reasons and therefore true decisions come aboard, come into being, really would require to you know, clarify the kind of structure that must be there that corresponds to a reason or an alternative and a decision. And that's why I just sketched it. I would bet, of course, like we all would, that the girl who is you know, doing the cookie paradigm will have clearly or already both the alternatives in her mind and the reasons in her mind earlier on at some point. To your second question, yes, definitely, both conscience and free will are graded. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I think we might have, oh, I see a question from Mark, and then we might have one last question about consciousness from Aaron that is waiting from the previous uh, question session. So Mark, please go ahead. Yes, uh, uh, I have a question about your argument against computer consciousness. Uh, that seems to depend upon how the computer is wired couldn't you actually build a computer that is wired like the brain? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, so th this is a question that we have debated at length and also discussed with you know, people who know much more about computer architectures. In principle, you could build a machine, call it a computer, that is wired like the brain, and then IT would have no principal reason against it being conscious as you and I are once you understand sort of the details of it, okay? Absolutely, it's not that, you know, machine content is not possible because machines are bad, no. It's because, as you point out, how they are wired, okay? Currently, neuromorphic computers, from what I understand, I don't know the very latest, but even though they may have some neuromorphic parts, the bus, for instance, typically is not. And so the moment there is a bottleneck like that, it falls apart. Same is true for the, you know, if you think, could computers connected by the internet, you know, form a giant conscious entity? No, it always goes to the wrong kind of bottlenecks. So I think the current day computers and the typical computers, no, but a potential computer that in the end is physically much closer to our brain, it could. Even that, I'll just, you know, take the opportunity to say so, uh, is more delicate than it might seem at first because this vertical exclusion that I mentioned before that the unit and the time update so to speak and the states that matter are the one that you know guarantee maximum ex intrinsic existence maximum phi that depends on a lot of factors so in the brain it may be the neuron and or the micro column would be my guess okay we still don't know but it's potentially testable thing. What's the real unit, okay? The one for which the system defines itself as existing the most. Is it the neuron or the microcolumns? And don't say, let's say it's the neuron. And then is the transistor say, which would be the natural you know, unit in the computer, good enough? Or it turns out when you analyze it, it actually disintegrates into smaller stuff, okay? Unlike the neuron. And then all bets are off. So I mean, I don't know the answer to that. I'm saying in principle, sure, you could do it with something that's not a brain, 
But in practice, current day computers, no, because that we have proven, essentially, it's not published, but it's proven. And uh, they have the wrong architecture. And, uh, you know, others, well, it's complicated and delicate. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Julio. Aaron, please go ahead. All right. Thank you, uh, Julio, for, for an illuminating, uh, excellent talk. Uh, in fact, for two, I should say two excellent talks in a way, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll read my question, which I posted earlier to the chat. Um, the axioms that you offered seem to me to describe the contents of consciousness rather than consciousness itself. So suppose I were to assert, I guess I will assert that IIT is a theory that describes how the contents of consciousness are organized rather than a theory of how those consciousness become consciously experienced. So how can we be sure that IIT is a theory of consciousness per se, rather than a theory of how the contents of consciousness are organized? So the contents of consciousness depends how you define them, because the experience itself is just the overarching content. So it's not in IIT the contents are pieces and the experience as such is not a content. It's just the overarching content and experience is its content. Okay, and what the, the axioms are, you know, each axiom typically when I try to really go through them, it's like an hour each, okay. But the best way to think about them at first is really as an extension of the Cartesian insight, okay. So what the Cartesian insight says is that there is something, if you wish, rather than nothing, that's one way to put it, and that something is experience, okay. It's independent of what it might contain. There is just something. And then the axiom of IIT is indeed, uh, each of them are immediate, indubitable, and true of every conceivable experience. And we could go through this exercise for each and every one of them, but not now. But again, they are not specific, that's the whole point, to any given content, whether the content is a part of the experience or the experience as a whole. So in other words, the fact that the experience is for the subject is subjective, is true for every conceivable experience, doesn't matter which experience doesn't matter whether I'm seeing something, hearing something, or being in a pure present state. The axiom that is structured is true no matter how it's structured. That it is specific, it says it has to be a particular way, but it doesn't tell you which way. So it's true for every possible experience. And integration, again, it doesn't tell you that the, you know, when I hear a flash, a bang and I see a flash, that is integrated, which IIT says, by the way. Uh, and, and in another experience uh, is not. It's applicable to any possible experience. And finally, that it is definite, it's also true of every conceivable experience. You cannot conceive of any experience, doesn't matter what you're thinking of or what you're experiencing, that's less or more. So it's completely, by definition, independent of any particular content. It's true of every conceivable experience, but it applies to all possible experiences. So, so that's sort of the you know, short answer to that. But the exercise to do really is to see that every axiom is immediate, indubitable, as well as true of every conceivable experience. Um, there are lots of additional things to discuss about what is the role of introspection to actually sort of access the axiom and so on, but let's leave that for another time. Um, yeah. Diad, what do, what, do, what do we do now? Exactly, because I'm, I would love to stay and talk uh, for hours about this, but unfortunately we are out of time. So at this point, I think we will just have to part and I welcome anyone if you have additional questions, we can um, you know, post them on the chat or we can send it to Julia or just send it to Julia ourselves. And we'll probably find um, many more ways to continue this dialogue. But I really want to thank you, Julia, for giving us this introduction about IIT, also presenting new data and results that we haven't seen that are intriguing and, and very interesting and for highlight, uh, kind of showcasing IIT's uh, um, approach to the free will debate, which is something that we are, of course, very interested in. So many, many thanks for this uh, talk, uh, Julio, and many thanks for the panelists and everyone here in the audience that sent their uh, questions. I'm and thank you, everyone, for your patience. And uh, I would love, obviously, to hear more and discuss more with whoever is interested. And thanks for the effort that you're making to put together neuroscience and philosophy on such an issue. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you so Julio. Much.